I'm Dayton Debs, commercial flight instructor and designated pilot examiner for Lone Star Magni Gyro in Taylor, Texas. Welcome to our 10-part sport pilot video series on how to fly the modern gyroplane, namely the Magni M16. This video series is intended to be offered as a supplement to professional flight training. It's not a replacement for hands-on training with a certified flight instructor. Please receive training in the specific type of gyroplane that you're flying as some maneuvers, while appropriate to the Magni M16, could result in injury or death in other gyroplane types. The topics of this video series are ranged from a pre-flight inspection prior to boarding the aircraft to a post-flight inspection and securing the aircraft after landing. Let's get started with our first part, pre-flight inspection. Behind me is the aircraft that we'll be using for today's lesson. I'll be using a checklist which should always be used to, to be sure that all parts of the pre-flight inspection are covered. Checklists will be used often throughout this video series and you should be sure to implement one in your flight as well. You can download your own copy of the checklist by clicking on the link below. Please take a moment to print this out so that you can follow along as we go. To begin our pre-flight inspection, we'll start with item number one on the checklist, master switch on. The master switch controls all of our electrical systems and as we turn it on, we'll make sure that the turbo control unit caution and warning lights turn on and then off. This assures us that the turbocharger electronics are working properly. We'll check the fuel pumps for run and pressure. This aircraft has two electrically driven fuel pumps. As we turn the first fuel pump on, we'll check that the fuel pressure indicator shows a rise in fuel pressure. We will turn off the first fuel pump, check that the fuel pressure drops, and repeat the process with the second. Next, we'll check the fuel gauge for operation and proper fuel level reading. We're currently showing approximately a quarter tank of fuel. This will be confirmed with actual fuel level later in the pre-flight. We'll now check the trim switch for operation. The trim operates off the coolie hat on top of the stick. To trim for higher air speeds, push forward, and for slower air speeds, pull back. When pulled back, the trim spring tightens, and when pushed forward, the trim spring loosens. When the trim is all the way forward, the trim light will illuminate. This may take a moment as the trim has to travel to its end limit. With the trim all of the way forward, we release the trim hat. The light should turn off. We can now turn the master switch off. We should check the cyclic for looseness or play and smooth movement. By grabbing the fore and aft cyclic and moving them together, you can make sure there's no play between the two. Check the rudder pedal rods, links, and cables. The front rudder pedals are connected to the nose wheel and rear pedals by rods. The rear pedals are connected to the rudder by cables. Check that the rods are secure and the cables are unfrayed. Now we'll check for continuity in the pre-rotator system by squeezing the pre-rotator lever and watching to make sure that the belts operate and release. Stepping back, we'll check the fuselage body for cracks. While the body is not structural, any evidence of cracks could indicate damage from a previous flight. Now make sure that the windshields are clean. Bugs can affect your field of view and even look like aircraft on the horizon. Check to make sure that the windshield screws are all secure and in place. It's a good idea to run your finger over all the screws to make sure that none of them are loose. Lastly, look for any cracks in the windshield that could compromise its integrity. As our last item on the right side of the cockpit, we'll check that both the front and rear seat belts are secure and in good condition. The first item in the rotor head and mast is to look for any cracks or deformities in the structure. The mast on this gyro is split near the rotor head so the aircraft can fit into a shipping container. The split mast is held together by four bolts. Look to be sure that the bolts are securely in place. Moving up to the rotor head, we want to check the hub bar for any cracking or deformations. We'll then check to make sure that the nuts and bolts are securely in place. There are seven safety pins to look for in the rotor head two in each rotor blade, one in the teeter or Jesus bolt, one in the roll bolt, and one in the pitch bolt. It can be noted that the pin in the pitch bolt is a different style than the others. Inspect the pre-rotator ring gear, flex cable, and bendix housing. The ring gear should be in good condition with no missing teeth, the flex cable securely in place, and the bendix housing undamaged.
Check the control rod links and rod end bearings. The control rod should be able to twist freely, but not have movement other than twist. The rod ends should have tamper evident marks on them to show that the nuts and or bearings have not backed off the control rods. Some rods may seem to be able to twist more than others. At different stick positions, some rods may be more limited than at other positions in their ability to twist. This is completely normal. The trim cable behind the mast should be checked for continuity and fraying. The trim spring and bracket should be checked for security. You should also check that the white trim motor at the bottom of the mast is securely in place. Moving on to the right side of the fuel tank, we will check to see that the fuel quantity matches what we saw on the fuel indicator earlier. We will lift the tab on the fuel filler cap, twist 90 degrees and pull straight out. We will visually inspect the fuel quantity and then replace the cap by pushing it straight in, twisting it back 90 degrees and pushing the tab down flush with the cap. On the right side of the undercarriage, we will first check the landing gear leaf spring for any cracks or damage. The landing gear leaf spring is all fiberglass consisting of two unidirectional fiberglass spars enclosed in a fiberglass enclosure. For this reason, any cracks should be investigated closely. The leaf spring is secured by two bolts on each side. Make sure that the bolt goes all the way through and is secured by a nut on the bottom side of the leaf spring. Check the wheel and wheel pants for security. The wheels are secured by four bolts on the back side of the wheel pant. It's okay if one of these bolts is shorter than the others. This bolt holds the brake caliper in place. The wheel pants are secured with two small bolts on the inside of the wheel pant and one larger bolt on the outside. Now, take a step back towards the front of the aircraft and look at the tire to determine if it's inflated properly and that the tire has sufficient tread for your flight. To check the brakes on the M16, start at the brake master cylinder. Both the left and right brake are controlled by a single master cylinder. The brake fluid reservoir is in the master cylinder. Check for security and leaks here. The brake tubing runs under the rear seat to a T under the leaf spring. Check for any leaks at this T. The brake line then splits and runs through each side of the leaf spring to each wheel where the brake line terminates at the brake caliper. Check for any leaks under the brake caliper. For the right side of the engine, begin by checking the carburetor links and cables. Be sure that the throttle cable is tight and secure and the choke cable should have some play in it. The engine is secured to the airframe by four bolts, two on each side. Check to make sure that the two on this side are secure and that the motor mount is free of any cracks. Cylinder heads on Rotax engines are liquid cooled, so be sure that you have coolant in the reservoir and overflow. The reservoir should never be open when the engine is hot. If there is coolant in the clear overflow bottle, you should have coolant in the reservoir. Now check the oil reservoir for security and sufficient oil quantity. To get a proper oil quantity reading, the Rotax engine should be burped. To do this, take the cap off of the oil reservoir, make sure that the keys are off and out of the ignition, and spin the prop in the direction of normal rotation until the oil burps or gurgles. Now check to make sure that the oil quantity is on the flat part of the dipstick and secure the cap back on top of the reservoir. I always like to place the cap in the seat I will be occupying it, so I make sure I don't forget to put it back on. Run your hand under the oil filter to be sure it's secure and not leaking. Check the radiator and heat exchanger for security, damage, and leaks. The engine heads and covers should be checked for security and leaks. There are two spark plugs on every cylinder. Check to make sure the rubber spark plug leads are securely on each plug. You may want to very gently tug on the spark plug lead to be sure that it isn't loose. Look for any loose wires in the engine area. Look over all of the tubing and hose clamps to be sure that no hoses are leaking and that hose clamps are secure. For the 914 engine, the turbo control unit is a computer located on the back side of the mast. It controls the wastegate for the turbocharger. Check to make sure that it's securely in place and that all of the wires are securely clipped into it. The exhaust pipe should be checked for any cracks as well as security. The Rotax 914 has two electric fuel pumps. Check to make sure that the fuel pumps are securely in place that the wires running to them are secure, and that the fuel lines are in good shape. 
On the Rotax 912, you will only have one electric fuel pump, as it also has a mechanical fuel pump on the gearbox. Finally, the pre-rotator should be checked at the lower end to be sure that the flex cable is secured to the pulley, the belts are not cracked or broken, and that the brake on the pre-rotator lever is tight against the belts. On this aircraft with a spinner, it's impossible to see the propeller hub. The hub is checked at every 100 hour inspection, but the spinner should be inspected for security. Each propeller blade should be inspected for cracks or damage, particularly on the leading edge. First check the tailplane surfaces for cracks and damage. The tailplane should also be checked for security to the airframe. It's secured to the aircraft by three bolts under the horizontal stabilizer. The rudder should be checked for security and freedom of movement. By placing the aircraft on the tail wheel, you can move the rudder to its full deflection in both ways. The nose wheel should move with the rudder. Also check to make sure that the safety wire on top of the rudder is securely in place. The pulley underneath the rudder should be checked to make sure that the rudder guide cable is tight and there's nothing blocking the movement of the rudder. Check to make sure that the tail wheel is securely in place and not damaged. The left side of the engine should be checked in the same way as the right with a couple of added components. In addition to all the checks on the right side, we should check the air filter to make sure that it is clean and tightly secured to the aircraft. There should also be safety wire to hold the air filter on in case the hose clamp comes loose. Also, check to make sure the wastegate actuator and spring are in good shape, with the cable secured and the wastegate servo securely attached to the mast. The only other difference on this side is that you have your battery and voltage regulator wires to check as well. The left side of the undercarriage and brake system should be checked the same as the right side. The fuel filter should be checked for leaks and security. Then follow the fuel lines to look for cracks and to make sure that the hose clamps are all secure. Now take a sample of fuel out of the fuel sump to check for fuel quality, contaminants, or any water in the fuel. Because water is heavier than fuel, you will see a distinct line separating water and fuel if there is water present. Any water contaminants must be sumped out before flying. Also, make certain the sump is not leaking before moving on with the inspection. The left side of the rotor head and mast should be checked the same as the right side. The left side of the cockpit and fuselage should be checked the same as the right with the addition of the throttles and brakes. Make certain that the throttles advance smoothly all the way to full throttle and back. On Rotax 914 equipped aircraft, you should advance the throttle past the detent to make sure the throttle will move into turbo power when needed. Squeeze each brake to check for brake pressure. Check that the nose wheel is secure, the bearing is not loose, and the wheel movement is smooth by lifting the aircraft onto its tail, rotating and spinning the nose wheel, then placing the nose back down. The pitot tube is how the airspeed indicator recognizes how fast the aircraft is traveling through the air. The pitot tube should be inspected for any obstructions or damage. Rotor blades should be inspected before every flight. First, release the rotor brake and walk the blade to the side of the aircraft. From here, you can easily walk the length of the rotor blade to inspect it for cracks, damage, and cleanliness. Gently toss the rotor blade so the other blade will spin towards you for inspection. While the blade is spinning, listen and look for any binding in the main rotor bearings. The blade should turn smoothly and without noise. Inspect the second rotor blade. After inspection, lift and lower the blade to feel for any binding in the teeter bearings. You may feel a slight flexing in the blades, but you should not feel the bearings grab or bind at all. Walk the blades fore and aft. With the blades fore and aft, engage the rotor brake again. As a final pre-flight check, 
Inspect that the prop clearance from the keel has not changed from previous flights. This is just a final check to make sure that the aircraft was not damaged on the previous flight. Finally, make sure that all of the required paperwork is in the aircraft. The airworthiness certificate should be displayed at the cabin or cockpit entrance so that it's legible to passengers or crew. The registration should be inspected for expiration. The operating limitations should be on board and complied with. And the weight and balance should be on board and within limits. This completes our pre-flight checklist. If anything on the aircraft does not pass the pre-flight inspection, do not fly the aircraft. Contact the aircraft owner or maintenance personnel to have the issue resolved. It's far better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. If everything checks out, the aircraft's ready to fly. We'll see you on our next lesson, which will cover startup, taxi, and pre-rotation.